Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of our Lord here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are glad you are with us this morning. If you're here with us in person, pass the friendship pads down the pews, get to know your neighbors, and if you have a prayer request, those can be put on the pink cards that will be collected during our second hymn. If you're worshiping with us online, we invite you to tell us where you're worshiping from and to put your prayer requests in the comment sections to be included in our prayers as a people this morning. We have several announcements this morning. First, uh, next Sunday, July or June, skipping month, June 18th, uh, will be our annual congregational meeting. So we will vote on the budget and on uh, terms of call and on new officers. So we hope you will join us. That will be um, 1130 next week. On uh, June 25th is our church picnic. We're going to be having that at Hopkins Park from 12.30 to 3.30. Um, please sign up today. There are sign-ups still available, and if you haven't signed up by today, well, you can still call the church office if you're trying to get those numbers. Our VBS is coming up. We're partnering with Neighbors House again this year to offer the summer reading vacation, which I have now turned into the Summer Reading Vacation Bible School all one big acronym uh, but that will be July 10th through the 14th with a party on the 14th if you want to sign your kids up let me know and if you would like to volunteer I would also be more than happy to talk to you uh, the summer book club will be meeting July 5th at 6 30 we're reading the book of longing by Sue Monk Kidd and next or this coming Saturday June 17th we are hosting a Presbytery event here at the church <coughs> called People, Place, and Purpose. It was in the, um, the newsletter this month, but if you haven't had a chance to sign up for it, we would love for you to come. It is a, it's being put on by the Matthew 25 Committee of the Black Hawk Presbytery, and we'll be talking about building community coalitions, creative building use, uh, community assessment, and there will be a sharing of ideas at the end. So it is $15 to help offset the cost of lunch, and we hope you will come. <coughs> from 9.30 to 2, uh, 2 p.m. next Saturday. So feel free to talk to me about that. Are there any other announcements this morning? Come on up. You got that? Yeah, they can't hear you online if you don't speak into a mic. Okay, I just wanted to mention to everyone who submitted your pledge <coughs> agreement Thank you so much. We got a lot of them back, and you're, you're the backbone of the church because it takes all of us as a community. Thank you so much. Good morning. I just wanted to draw your attention one more time to the Pentecostal offering envelopes that are uh, inserted into the bulletin. So if you haven't already done so, please consider uh, donating to the Pentecost special offering. Thank you. Let us continue to worship.
let us rise in body or in spirit and join in our call to worship. Jesus spoke to the crowd and said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. God promises to love us and forgive us, not because we are righteous or law-abiding, but simply because we are. Trusting in God's steadfast love, let us confess our sins together. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth. Admit our sin and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And all God's people say, Because we are buried with Christ in these waters, we are also raised to life with him. Believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. 
Thanks be to God. Hear the words of God and be called to deeper faith. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with God? As people forgiven and loved, let us share that forgiveness and peace with all those around us. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please pass the peace in whatever way feels most comfortable.
marks a time in our service where we have a special message for the children of God. We are all called God's children, and we are all invited at this time. I think some of our big kids are being extra invited today. Come on up. I like your shirt. <laughs> I have a special book for us. Good morning, Lindsay. Are you coming? Come on over for story time. We've got a new story, and I want to read this to you. It's from, it's by Jackie Lewis, who is a pastor. Uh, she grew up in Chicago, which is not far from here, but now she works in New York. I like to go to Chicago, too. Your mom grew up in New York. My sister lives in New York. How cool is that? So this book is called, You Are So Wonderful. Are you wonderful? Yeah, I think so. So, we've got some scripture here. You are the one who put me together inside my mother's body, and I praise you because of the way, the wonderful way you created me. That comes from the Psalms. You are wonderful. This is true. They're so high up to the sky. That's a good swing. It is a tire swing. You're right. God made no one else like you. It does look like Jaden over here. Are you in this book? That person is upside down, I think. I think we can't see his head. No one else has a face like you. Can you make a silly face right now? I love it. I love it. No one else has feet like you. Where are your feet? There they are. No one else has a nose like you. Look at all the different noses. Some of them are. No one else has toes like you. We can't see anybody's toes but mine today. We're not going to take shoes off. No one else has a grin. Has your grin? Where's your grin? Do you know what a grin is? It's like a smile. It's a big smile. You smile big? <laughs> that no one else has a smile just like you? No one else has your chin. It does look like a straw, but I think they're monkey bars, kind of. Kind of. Yep. It's just one monkey bar. No one else has hands like these, hands that help and make God pleased. There is a baby, and look how the big sister is helping. He does have a lot of ice cream. That's a big ice cream cone. Do you help feed your baby sister? You did. Were you so big and helpful? Precious child, there's just one you. Baby. There's another baby. Uh, baby. Baby. To learn, to love, and to have fun, too. He likes it. He does. We know. It's a really big globe. It is a really big globe. It almost looks like the whole earth. It does. It is the whole earth. It's a globe of the whole earth. And it says, we know you are special. Wonderful you. And then that is just North and South America. We'd have to spin the globe around to see the other parts of the world, wouldn't we? And let's read this last part. That's right. This is a quote from Maya Angelou, and it says, It is time to teach young people early that early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. So even though we all might look different and we have different chins and different toes. We are all wonderfully made. You are so wonderful. Let's say a prayer. Holy God, thank you for making me wonderfully me and all of us wonderfully our own selves. May we see how precious we all are because we are all different, but we are loved by you. Amen. All right, see you guys next week.
Let us unite in the prayer for illumination. Lord God, help us to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Through Christ our Lord. Our scripture reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. We read from chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. The apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might gain all the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to gain Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might gain those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not outside God's law, but am within Christ's law, so that I might gain those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might, by all means, save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might become a partner in it. Here ends the reading of the text. May God add his blessings to this, the reading of his holy word. As we sing our next hymn, if you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold it up so that the ushers can collect it. Let us pray.
Be with us, gracious God, as we come to your word. May it be a message that we not only hear with our ears, but a message that is imprinted upon our hearts. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So this week, we continue our series on evangelism, and the theme is worship. And as you listen to the text, it doesn't seem exactly like worship. Here we have the Apostle Paul talking about the way he wants to reach out to people for the purpose of the gospel. And he refers first to the Jews and then he refers to that next bunch of people that have attached themselves to the synagogue, those people who appreciate the law but weren't born a Jew, but they appreciate what can be found in the roots of the Hebrew faith. And then he also talks about those that are beyond the law, those that haven't come into contact with the faith in any way and yet are somehow still people that can be reached by what the gospel message is. And then finally, he talks about the weak, and finally he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might become a partner to it. It sounds a little bit like Paul has become the perfect politician. He has managed to find a way to reach various constituencies and to do it in such a way that recognizes who they are as individuals. I think that's where the passage probably has the most to do with worship. He recognizes that everybody comes to worship with different experiences and different backgrounds and even different agendas. And all of us come to worship with something different on our mind this day. We are thinking about those things in our life. And maybe there are big issues that remain unresolved. And maybe there are issues that are not quite so big. But they still challenge us and trouble us. Or maybe it's a day when everything seems right with the world. But in each case, Scripture has its own message to bring. Uh, the service of worship tries to carry us through the parts of the Christian life. And worship, as we usually do it, is bracketed with Scripture. And so we start with a call to worship that usually comes from Scripture or certainly picks up scripture themes. And having said a little bit about who we are as God's people gathered together and being addressed by scripture, we are also moving on to a hymn that talks about the character of God. And so today we sang about the king and about our worship that we offered to the king. And that having understood who God is, we better recognize our own sinfulness. And so the next thing that happens in worship is the call to confession and a prayer to confession that says, Lord, we understand who you are in your holiness and we understand who we are in our failed attempts to be holy. So in our sinfulness, we come and confess and even here, God speaks to us. God speaks to us with an encouragement that Lord, the Lord is merciful. And in words of assurance, we are reminded that just as in our baptism, sin was washed away. So as we renew ourselves in prayer, we come before God and find ourselves transformed. The service begins a transition as we hear words from scripture call us to greater faithfulness. And having been assured that we belong to God 
and that we can aspire to better be God's people. Then we sing a word of praise and also, well, we pass the peace of Christ with one another. Uh, for us, that passing of the peace has moved around a little bit, but classically, the church has always put it here, that after we understood ourselves forgiven and redeemed, we are best fit for our relationships with one another. And so for a moment in service, we stop and greet one another. It's a reminder, I think, that all of us have such an important role to play in worship. Every prayer, every song, every greeting, it all matters to all of us. I hope you feel like you've done something good by being here today. Or for those of you online, I hope you get that same impression that together we are so much better. And together our worship reflects what it is we can offer to God. You know, it's a lot to ask somebody to concentrate for an hour. <laughs> and lots of times we don't make it. But even in the ups and downs of our inattention, even in it all, we carry each other through the parts of the service. So, we came, we remembered who God was, we understood who we were as forgiven people, we recognized the community we belong to, and then we begun to be addressed by the word. And it starts with the choir singing an anthem or the bell choir playing a piece of music that evokes something in us. There's an old adage that says, he who sings prays twice, and of course, you have to say, she or they who sing also pray twice. And so in those words, we are reminded that something happens with music. And, you know, there are people who just, music doesn't do anything for them, but most people are moved and touched by the fact that in singing, we offer ourselves up to God. Um, one of my evaluations, somebody made the comment, you know, if we're trying to reach a younger audience, why are we singing hymns from the 16th century? <laughs> and that's a really good question sometimes. And sometimes it's just because we know them. But other times it's because it's a way for us to connect through the church, to the church, through the ages, that all of them have... Uh, contributions to make. I remember somebody saying, why don't we sing the old hymns anymore? <laughs> and uh, at that point, I replied, well, we sang something from the ninth century. That ought to qualify. <laughs> uh, but even if it's not our cup of tea, even if it's not our particular taste in music, it is a way for us to connect what the church has contributed to us through the ages. And then, after the choir, after the children's message, and the number of times people say to me, you know, I'm never sure what you're talking about, but boy, that children's message really helped me out today. <laughs> and all of it can address us by God's word. Uh, and so that children's message becomes just as important as any other part of the service. And then, having prayed for understanding, we move to scripture, and okay, this next hymn that fits in the service, it's kind of a space holder. Uh, gives me a chance to get my wits about me, and also for you to be distracted for a minute while I fumble around with water and Kleenexes. So, but it's also so appropriate for us at any point in the service to sing and offer our praise to God. And now we get to the sermon. And so what the sermon does and what the hope is is that scripture is opened up 
and that having scripture opened up for our understanding we're better able to face what lies ahead at one point we read a number of passages more recently we've gone to just reading one but in any event scripture is there to address us and it can address each of us in so many different ways the promise is that even though a passage is familiar, the Spirit can make it speak to us in a different way given different circumstances in our life. Uh, the 23rd Psalm, it's very familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And in that passage, I've had some say, oh, it's been so spoiled to me by the funerals I've gone to that I can't hardly bear to listen to it in regular church. And others say that it is always such a comfort. And the fact that the image of the psalm changes, it starts out that the one who is our shepherd and then the one who is our host who can prepare a table even in the presence of enemies. But in that movement, the one that guides us, and the one that gives us a place to rest, there is such powerful comfort. And that's where preaching has its power. The power that comes from the word. The word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and somehow even indwells in preaching. Uh, I remember in one of my preaching classes, um, the pastor who was leading us, and the professor, I mean, he was both, and he made some comment uh, about the fact God can speak through even the worst sermon. But, <laughs> but must you always try him so? <laughs> uh, and so there is that recognition that the good that comes out of it doesn't come from the eloquence of the speaker or the power of the illustration, but the fact that God is in the midst of that word, and that word strengthens our faith. So the sermon's over, and we stand, and having heard the word in a particular way, we now say it in a more general way, and so we stand and affirm our faith using a variety of confessions, some derived from Scripture, some out of the history of the church, but each of them uh, providing a way to confess our faith universal, a broader picture of faith. And then there's prayers and offering, a chance for us to respond. And so we offer our prayers to God, we offer our gifts to God, and then we are sent out into the world with a benediction that usually from Scripture describes what it is we are called to be during this next week. This whole sequence of worship that moves us from a recognition of who God is to who we are to being addressed by God's word, to being sent out into the world, that happens each week in our service. And it becomes a way for us to be renewed. It comes a way for us to offer service and prayer. It comes a way for us to rethink what's going on in our life and to move us to someplace else. There is not one thing that happens in the service, but there are many things that all point us back to God and to the way that God is in our midst, even to the point of being in those we are worship with. This is fundamentally some of the best news that the church has to offer that God still speaks, that God is with God's community, and in the midst of that community, we can both pray and offer ourselves 
with the knowledge that God is here for us. As we seek to speak a word to the world, maybe one thing we could say to those who are familiar to us, even to those who are strangers, come join me in worship. That's one of the most powerful evangelistic tools we can ever have. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our prayers today, uh, there are no uh, specific prayer cards that I received, but we do want to remember our congregational meeting comes next week as we think about what the congregation has done this past year and what we look ahead to in the coming year. Uh, I invite you all to be in prayer for this congregation. Let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the way you care for our lives, for the ways that we may encounter you through scripture, through fellowship, through the study of the word, through our service to you. And may each of these avenues be ways that we find our faith strengthened and our lives drawn closer to you. We pray, gracious God, for the ministry of this congregation. May we be a place where your light and hope and well-being are conveyed by both what we say and what we sing, but also by what we do and how we serve. We pray for our world. We pray for our leaders and for their challenges. We pray for our nation. We pray for all those places that find themselves facing war and conflict. For those who are persecuted for their faith, for those who seek to spread the faith in distant lands. We pray for all your servants. Gracious God, we are mindful not only of those in our midst who have brought the truth of your word throughout all the ages, but we're thankful for that great fellowship that exists in heaven with you, for all those who have gone before us and who now rest from their faith. May their witness continue to encourage us, and may our witness be a means by which the world is encouraged. And so we pray as we have been taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer our gifts to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Receive these offerings and use them for your work in the world until thy kingdom come. Amen.
And now go out into the world in peace. Hold fast to that which is good. Give to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.